Nobody deserves to live like this. This has just been a nightmare. Are you making the right decision for your body? None of these products have actually gone through the rigorous process of being FDA approved. The FDA has uh, millions and millions of reports that aren't publicly available. This is affecting lives and it's major and nobody's really listening to us. About 32 million Americans, one in every 10, will have some kind of medical device implanted in their bodies. A joint, a pump, a piece of wire or mesh. Like drugs, we expect these devices to undergo rigorous testing. But the FDA does not require the same standards for medical devices as it does pharmaceutical drugs. For all the hope and improvement medical devices can provide, there is a dangerous side that for decades has remained hidden from public view. Thousands suffer in silence. In the next hour, we will show you the lack of regulation, the problems that remain hidden from public view, the money that makes all of this a lot more complicated, and the champions of change, the Texas lawmaker working to fix the broken system. We begin with an Austin mom whose painful 10-year journey sparked a movement for others to share their stories of medical device dangers. They bring me a lot of joy and they remind me not to be afraid and uh, knowing that they used to be used in the industry to test products, I can just really relate. We were, without our own consent, made to be guinea pigs. <laughs> I, I stayed in shape, I ran, I did everything I was supposed to do and I'm so bad! <laughs> and I had to do this twice. <laughs> When hope is fading. And it's been like this for so many years. And dreams seem dashed. I was gonna take him skiing. I was gonna play basketball with him. Sometimes. I was gonna be a good mom. You have nothing left to lose. <laughs> and they took all that for me. Sharing this part of life is not easy for Frances Scott. But for 10 years, it was her life. Good afternoon from the Raleigh Eyewitness News Center. I'm Frances Scott. And Once a successful television anchor in North Carolina, an active mom in her 30s with a husband and three kids, building a good life when hip pain took over. They said, basically, we think you were born without sockets, and then when you stood up to walk, the sockets formed in the wrong place. Doctors recommended a double hip replacement. I had been a runner, an athlete, really active. I'm not a sit-still kind of person, so I had put high miles on my hips, so to speak. She says her surgeon suggested the pinnacle with ultimate liner, a state-of-the-art metal-on-metal joint made by Johnson & Johnson Depew. These are my favorite popsicles of all time. A major Everybody. surgery for a 39-year-old mom. But doctors said she'd be back on her feet in a few months. I just never got out of pain. I was trying to go back and be on camera, go back to work, and I had these oozing boils all over my face. That's when I started notice, noticing the tinnitus, the hearing loss. And memory loss. I was driving on the interstate, the main road, and I, I couldn't figure out how to get back to work for, you know, two or three minutes. And it was terrifying. Frustrated, she searched for answers. But in the U.S., there is no medical device registry. I could find more out about my child's car seat than I could find out about what's implanted in my body. She did find research from England where patients with the same implant were suffering from metal poisoning. I kept wondering, but everyone I saw kept saying, no, nah, the pinnacle's great, it's a great hip. I can't, I can't help you. And then they stopped taking my appointments, so I knew I was on my own. <laughs> She lost her job, forced to sell her home and move her family to Texas. It's a tragedy. Attorney Mark Lanier does not represent Francis, but has successfully represented hundreds of people against the makers of metal hip replacements, the Pinnacle and Johnson & Johnson Depew included. 
The experiences have had a wide range. Some people have experienced everything from hearing loss and what are called systemic problems as those metal ions and the metal debris goes throughout the body. Some have experienced heart issues. Some have experienced memory issues. Most experience pain around the implant and a loss of muscle and, and ligaments. The head of Johnson & Johnson DePuy's development team warned company leaders of issues with metal and metal implants in 1997 before implanting the pinnacle with the ultimate liner in people. This memo filed in court shows metal on metal was a bad engineering design. Where is a major problem. In simulator testing, performance is unpredictable, working well for a period of time before suffering a sudden catastrophic breakdown, which includes releasing a large volume of debris. The FDA oversees all medical devices and drugs, but the approval process is very different. Drugs have to undergo human trials. Most medical devices do not. So many of our doctors that we've put under oath and talked to about this were stunned to find out that the company never tested the device in people. Essentially, we're just playing a game of whack-a-mole. The FDA has known this is a problem, admitting it in this video four years ago. One device manufacturer can meet FDA requirements and still make a poor quality device. I think a lot of people assume that the FDA itself tests devices. And when they find out that the FDA does not, then they begin to understand that, that there are issues. Johnson & Johnson DePue faces more than 10,000 lawsuits across the country. And in January, agreed to pay $120 million to resolve state attorneys general claims of deceptive marketing in metal-on-metal -metal hip implants. The ultimate liner was pulled off the market in August 2013, two years yeah. after Francis got it. Inside the ball. Mm -hmm. Just last year, Francis finally found a doctor to remove her metal hips. I would say about 80% of the symptoms that were really troubling me went away within weeks. She says she still suffers from hearing and vision loss, and because the metal destroyed some of her tissue, she dislocated a hip last summer. I'm not the worst case by any means. Is it my turn? Family time in her 40s is much different than she imagined. Oh my goodness, I got a whole hand. Somewhere between the loss and the pain. What I grieve most, you can't give me back. Frances Scott found her purpose. I want this fixed. I want the laws changed. I want things changed so that this can't happen to other people. Right after this story aired, we began hearing from others who had been experiencing pain, sometimes for years, with no answers. Working from home is a necessity for 54-year-old Carrie Light. I can't walk from here to the door without them grinding and trying to come out of socket. A hip deformity left her in a wheelchair until doctors recommended a double hip replacement in 2014. I just, I thought everything was going to be better after that. And and it was for a little while. Within six months, the pain and clicking became too much, so she went back to the doctor. He's like, I looked at your x-rays, everything looks good, your components are perfect. For years, she suffered in silence, living with the pain. Then she saw this on KVU. And it's been like this for so many years. Frances Scott talking about her struggle with a double hip replacement, a device she says made her sick. It hit home for Carrie. I rewound and I watched it again and I was just shocked. And I was like, oh my God, that's me. That's me. The KV defenders uncovered that the FDA lacks testing requirements and has very little regulation when it comes to implanted medical devices. In fact, in the last year, we found more than 27,000 reports of injuries from hip implants and 111 deaths. But you won't find any of that on the FDA website. I think we need legislation to mandate a registry. After seeing the KV Defenders investigation, Texas Congressman Lloyd Doggett hopes to change that. We're trying to draw that balance between providing and encouraging innovation, but protecting the consumer. And I don't think we've drawn it very well in this area. This girl got a 
She didn't even know they were going to put anything in her. People from across the country are now sharing their stories with Francis, Representative Doggett, and the KVU Defenders. Now I'm setting aside specific time just to answer messages on the computer. People like Carrie, who just this month suffered a seizure. It was enough for doctors to finally order a test to check the metal ions in her blood. She's grateful, but says she doesn't need a test to know something is not right. I can't stand for more than two or three minutes without being in excruciating pain. Her search for answers continues. Now she hopes the FDA takes action. If you're talking about putting things inside somebody's body, you better know what's going to happen to them. So how do these devices get approved? Hip replacements, pacemakers, and stimulators can be approved two ways. The first is called pre-market approval. Manufacturers have to provide scientific evidence that the device is safe and effective. Most of the time, it involves human trials. The other way is 510K. It's a process the FDA enacted back in the 1970s as a way to get devices to the market faster. Those devices only had to prove that they were substantially equivalent to a device already on the market. The problem, as the New England Journal of Medicine pointed out, the examples of devices companies were using to get approval for new ones were sometimes voluntarily recalled. No one checks to make sure the previous devices had no problems or are in fact safe. In the last five years, 72% of the medical devices approved in the U.S. have been cleared through the faster alternate 510K process, meaning the majority of devices, more than 18,000, have never been tested in people. Medical device dangers go beyond hip replacements. Thousands of women have had mesh implanted in their bodies with devastating results. I was active, I rock climbed, I went boating, jet skiing, horseback riding, uh, ballroom dancing. Every, everything has been destroyed and it's not just me. They shared their stories with medical device makers. The response was unexpected. Nearly one in every five women suffer from prolapse, a condition where pelvic muscles no longer support pelvic organs. For years, surgeons made repairs using tissue from women's bodies. But in recent years, a surgical mesh has been used. Following thousands of complaints and years of warnings from the FDA itself, a public hearing shed light on what is growing evidence of medical device dangers. This is affecting lives and it's major and nobody's really listening to us. Women from across the country gathered in Maryland to share their stories about how mesh products changed their lives. I am one of over 100,000 women who have been severely and permanently harmed by the devastating complications from anterior transvaginal mesh. Mothers like Jody Callahan, who had surgery in 2010 at the age of 45 and after years of pain had the mesh removed in 2013. The doctor reported that the mesh had eroded into my bladder, attached to my bowels, my nerves, and my muscles. Last month, she learned she has to undergo another surgery. She says her doctor found more plastic mesh inside her body. I am scared, frustrated, and devastated that I will have to do this again. Medical device makers apologize to the women today. Boston Scientific is purposeful and is committed to providing medical devices that are safe and effective, that are supported by clinical evidence, that are supported by physician training and that will allow for the best possible clinical outcomes. The defenders have learned the FDA warned about serious complications involving mesh implants in 2008 and in 2011 mandated companies to produce studies to show the safety of the devices. I truly hope the FDA is serious about addressing the research development training as well as adequate oversight for future medical devices. Most of us get our prescriptions or procedures without knowing the financial incentives of the companies selling them. ProPublica launched Dollars for Docs, a website that compiles public information about pharmaceutical and medical device companies that pay doctors and hospitals. Since 2013, these are the 10 companies that have paid the most. Genetech, the first company, paid more than a billion dollars between 2013 and 2016. The top payments, were for drugs that treat various forms of cancer, including lymphoma and breast cancer. Depew Products is number three. That's the same company that sold the Pinnacle before it was pulled from the market. 
Knowing the true danger of certain devices is made more difficult by a little known rule that allows problems to remain hidden. And for the millions treated for hernias, it is life changing. Nobody deserves to live like this. These people, for money, it's not worth it. More than a million hernia surgeries are performed in the U.S. every year. The majority of those involve some type of plastic mesh. Last month, the Food and Drug Administration ordered manufacturers to stop selling mesh for use in pelvic prolapse or urinary incontinence cases. Despite that and thousands of issues reported to the FDA, plastic mesh continues to be the standard treatment for hernias with sometimes life-changing consequences. It's terrible. I'm nauseated, I'm throwing up. Everything's so tight like this, always, always. And I'm like, oh, I can't take a breath, I can't take a breath. It's affecting my heart, it is. Stuck at home is not how Carmen Pacheco expected to live out life in her 50s. In and out of the hospital, I've been in the hospital twice this month. Her pain and worry matched by her mountain of medical bills, a spiral that began six years ago when doctors performed what most consider routine surgeries, implanting plastic mesh for pelvic prolapse and a hernia. They never told me what, what could happen. And a year to the date, I had a strangulated hernia. The ambulance had to go pick me up. A second surgery resulted in a massive infection, followed by a third surgery and more pain. I can't do nothing now. I can't even eat. I've seen a lot of the plaintiffs that have a lifetime of injuries as a result, a lifetime of additional surgeries in pursuit of repairing the damage that's been done. Melissa Nafash does not represent Carmen, but is a New York attorney whose firm has more than 10,000 hernia mesh cases. Due to design defects in the meshes, um, often there is a surgery to remove that mesh polypropylene, which a lot of these products are made out of, can be thought of like a window screen. And tissue is intended to grow into that screen. It's as if you pour cement through a screen and let it dry, and then try to pull that screen out. Um, it has become a part of the body. Sound familiar? The doctor reported that the mesh had eroded into my bladder, attached to my bowels, my nerves, and my muscles. In February, dozens of women shared their stories at an FDA hearing about the problems associated with pelvic mesh. This is affecting lives, and it's major, and nobody's really listening to us. Former IT manager for the FDA, Madris Tomes, was there. And I wanted to present data on all types of mesh, but they only wanted to see um, it for stress urinary incontinence or pelvic organ prolapse. Tomes left the FDA and started Device Events LLC, which runs a website that makes information about problems with medical devices easy to find and understand. I did a search on hernia mesh and I found 25,000 adverse event reports to the FDA and over 200 of those reports were deaths. Last month, the FDA ordered manufacturers to stop selling some pelvic mesh, yet made no mention of hernia mesh. They really need to be looking, what are all the other devices that are just like this? So how did we get here? None of these products have actually gone through the rigorous process of being FDA approved. Dr. Vineet Chowdhury is a general surgeon specializing in hernia repair. I've done uh, close to a thousand hernia repairs, and I put mesh in, in almost every single one of them. Dr. Chowdhury says years ago, hernias were repaired using sutures or biological mesh made from animal tissue or human cells. That mesh tends to kind of absorb away over time. It gets real soft and pliable and doesn't last very long. Um, so it's not a permanent, really permanent solution, but it helps temporarily. Plastic mesh seemed to last longer, so it's been used more frequently since the 1980s. The great majority of patients tolerate the mesh extremely well and don't ever know that it's in there. When mesh goes well, it goes really well. But in the cases where it doesn't, it's not just a little bit of pain. It's, it's a disabling 
problem where people need multiple surgeries. In the first three months of this year, there have already been 2,400 reports of problems to the FDA and 15 deaths with hernia mesh. Most of those reported years after the initial surgery. And you can see Device Events has found that all of these events have started to increase in the last 10 years. The most common include infection, mesh that adheres to internal organs, even sepsis, and death. So the mesh doesn't stay where it's put by itself. Uh, after a period of time, it will incorporate into the surrounding structures and will remain intact. But as it's healing in place, it can definitely move or shift. I have bowel obstructions, uh, throwing up bile every morning. Carmen is not alone. Device events found more than 5,000 bowel obstructions, more than 5,600 infections. All people with hernia mesh, most happening since 2007. I had a hernia the size of a cherry. And now they're telling me it's the size of a tortilla. It's huge. Carmen used to weigh 225 pounds. See, this is the first surgery. Now she's barely 125, facing another surgery by an out-of-state doctor who says her only hope is to add more mesh. To be going through this, yes. They destroy my life, the mesh. It will destroy your body, your health. It will destroy your life. So what do you do if you have mesh? Pay attention to symptoms. If you experience any pain, you should get checked by your doctor. In most cases, people experience symptoms years after the surgery. And if you do have an issue, report it to the FDA. Makers of mesh are among a number of medical device manufacturers that have been given permission to pull some of the side effects into reports that can only be seen by the FDA. More on those hidden reports next. You didn't see reports for a really long time, so the devices must have gotten safer. But those reports were just being hidden in summaries that the people, the physicians couldn't even see. For decades, the FDA has allowed certain medical device manufacturers to report problems with devices that only government workers could see. As the KVU defenders uncovered, these hidden reports included serious problems like cancer. The view is so amazing. Life for Lacey Heatherly has never been clearer. And you see people like walking their dogs and biking. It makes me happy. It's so cute. It's been five months since a surgeon removed her breast implants. But a week after, I lost so much inflammation. Within a couple of weeks, I lost seven pounds of inflammation. My eyes got clear. My skin got clear. My acne that I had had went down. Her symptoms were similar to thousands of other women, but she had no way of knowing. The FDA has uh, millions and millions of reports that aren't publicly available. Madrice Tomes is a former IT manager for the FDA who started Device Events LLC. She says for decades the FDA has allowed certain manufacturers to file known side effects in what is known as alternative summary reports. And the FDA gives them an exemption, says okay you can submit these in summary format. And so what that is is it's a spreadsheet and it's not publicly available. It is sent to the FDA and they file it in document storage. And when, if you are trying to find the true number of problems with the device, you can't see those reports. A system set up in the 1970s to make reporting problems easier for certain medical device manufacturers. But Madrid discovered one report could contain thousands of problems. Mm -hmm. They had become a way to hide the true scope of what may be happening with certain medical devices. Case in point, breast implants. About two years ago, um, I had discovered that summary reports were being used for breast implants. Um, I did not know the extent of it, um, but what I'd found was that it appeared that device companies thought that a rupture wasn't a serious injury. And so they were saying, well, we can put this in a summary report. When she also found cases of lymphoma being hidden in these summary reports, she brought her findings to the FDA. It took my finding this pattern for the FDA to say, wait a minute, maybe these shouldn't have been coming in as summaries. Two years later, the FDA ordered manufacturers to make those issues public. 
problems jumped from 51,000 to nearly 300,000 overnight. So 90% of the reports that existed, the public didn't know about until that day. How many lives have to be lost before action takes place? Isn't one life enough? The FDA then ordered hearings. Dozens of women and doctors testified. I feel sad and angry. It's not just breast implants. Several manufacturers, including those that make implantable cardiac defibrillators, pacemakers, and tooth implants, have been allowed to file summary reports for decades, a practice the FDA announced just last week it is ending. But not before countless people like Lacey suffered silently. Oh, I'm so glad I got these things out of my body. Her experience has changed the way she views her own health. It makes me just weary of the FDA period. And this yeah. all comes back to, are you making the right decision for your body? Are you just completely trusting what the doctor says? If you think this just concerns breast implants, you are so wrong because this concerns everything we're doing with our bodies. We've been asking the FDA about these hidden reports. And just last month, the agency announced it is ending the practice of alternative summary reporting and plans to release them. We are still waiting on those reports. Many people who suffer get offered settlements from medical device manufacturers, but in return, they are often required to sign agreements which prevent them from talking about their experience. There's a, another level of secrecy that can be involved as well when people do sign items, uh, 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 sign agreements not to talk, not to speak of, not to disclose. That can come in on a settlement level. That can come in on a level of, of using a, a product or getting a replacement product. Uh, those secrecy agreements uh, are not good. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. And, and we need, pe people need to know we are in an age where knowledge should be available on our fingertips, not being secreted away. A professor in Georgia is studying the impact of those agreements. Still to come, the FDA can take up to two years to take action after learning about problems with a medical device. That's two years where you still have devices being implanted in patients. And even after learning about deaths, the FDA sometimes allows devices to still be used, which has some doctors taking matters into their own hands. Since 2011, 457 women were diagnosed with lymphoma. Nine women died from a cancer researchers determined was caused by textured breast implants. One of those patients who underwent months of treatment lives in Dripping Springs. Her cancer is so aggressive that her doctor will no longer put textured breast implants in patients, even though the FDA still allows it. Hi, Sandra. How are you doing? Doctor visits take on a whole new meaning when you've had cancer. How are you doing? Feeling better, yeah. And any changes? Especially a rare cancer you should have never had. It was shocking. I mean, I was in a lot of pain. Sandra Rush nearly died from lymphoma, a cancer doctors say she developed from her textured breast implants, a cancer most doctors didn't know about because the cases were hidden in summary reports that until months ago, only the FDA could see. It had metastasized all through my body. Dr. Elizabeth Potter helped reconstruct Sandra's tissue after taking out the breast implants, only to discover the cancer had spread. This breast implant associated cancer, which had occurred as a result of a cosmetic implant and had spread into her breast tissue, was now in her bones throughout her body. Sandra needed five rounds of chemotherapy and a stem cell transplant, treatment that left her in the hospital for months. It was really, really difficult. I heard that it was very rare, like one in a million. I never expected to actually see it in my own practice. Sandra was the third patient with textured breast implants that Dr. Potter had seen develop lymphoma. Too many for something not to change. In my mind, it's not safe enough to place a textured implant at this time. So I personally have removed it from my practice. I, I hoped that the FDA would simply remove a textured implant from the market while we found out more details. They chose not to do that. So, um, unfortunately, those implants are still being placed. 
Like so many women, Sandra expected those implants to change her life 25 years ago, just not in this way. It changes your world, it changes your life, definitely does. Still to come, an effort to get people off pain pills has pushed patients to get an implanted medical device that has left hundreds with life-changing side effects. So this has just been a nightmare from, from September 7th, 2017 until now. A 20-year veteran who has seen his share of pain now lives with a daily reminder. It is another medical device danger story that changed this Marine's life forever. I did tours in Guantanamo Bay, the Gulf War in 1991, uh, three tours in Okinawa. David Wynette has seen a lot. Uh, went to Egypt on an operation. 20 years in the Marines took him around the world, but the training took its toll. I developed uh, uh, degenerative discs, and I started experiencing uh, a lot of back pain during the last two to three years of my career. For years, pain pills helped. Then doctors pushed David to consider an alternative, a spinal cord stimulator. What they told me was that I could, I could relieve the back pain uh, and, and get off of the, uh, the opiates. Stimulators use electrical currents to block pain signals before they reach the brain. 50,000 are implanted worldwide each year. He scheduled surgery for September 2017, a one-week trial to see if he should get the permanent implant. So I came out into recovery. I woke up. And within about a minute of waking up, I felt a very intense pain in my left groin, an intense pain. And then the pain hit my back, and it was like somebody stabbing me in the, in the spine. It was just horrible. I started screaming. Doctors flew David to Austin for emergency surgery, removing the stimulator first. And oh my God, I thought the pain at the clinic was bad in my groin, and my back. Uh-uh. This was like a thousand times worse. Well, the next day, after I woke up and I'm in ICU, the doctor who had put the device in came to visit me, and, and he was apologizing and so forth. And I said, hey, doc, you know, that pain when they took that thing out was horrendous. And he said, didn't they turn it off? Why didn't he turn it off? Why didn't the company rep have the presence of mind to turn it off? Look at that, look at that. The lights are blinking. Mm. He took yeah, this video absolutely. while recovering in the hospital. And it literally felt like I had sparks inside my spine. It was that bad. An MRI taken right after they pulled him out in Austin showed that one of the leads had taken a wrong turn. It hadn't gone straight in. Doctors determined the stimulator hit a blood vessel, causing blood to fill his spinal column, killing the nerves of his spine. The life-changing surgery changed him in ways he never imagined. That's what paralyzed me. And it looks to be, unless there's a miracle cure for my paraplegia, it looks to be a lifetime uh, sentence. And I did not plan to spend my retirement this way, you know. I'm, I have to deal with the, the, the hand I'm dealt, you know. David is not alone. Device events found 681 people have been paralyzed by spinal cord stimulators and more than 100,000 other injuries, most since 2008. There are many heartbreaking stories, including David's. Attorney Dan Ross has represented a number of patients with spinal cord stimulator issues. Companies have been successful in getting judges to throw out these cases because they're preempted by a law that doesn't offer any remedies. The device David had implanted was approved a month before his surgery through the pre-market approval process, meaning it did undergo some human clinical trials. But because of that, he can't sue the manufacturer for what happened. A loophole Congressman Lloyd Doggett and others want to fix with the Medical Device Safety Act. It's important that doctors get this information in uh, and that we have the right, uh, everyone has the right to seek redress for their injury and that these companies don't hide behind the FDA. It is too late for David. Ironically, even after my paraplegia, I still have the same back pain because <laughs> I, I I'm paralyzed below that level. He makes the best of each day sharing his story in hopes of helping others know the risks. I tried to do the, the right thing. I tried to do what's politically correct nowadays to get off the opiates. Well, look what happened to me as a result. And if I had it to do over, I, I would have slept in that day. Many people wonder why there has been no class action in these cases. 
And this is different from a class action. Uh, in a class action, you have people that have been injured in the same way. Um, in mass tort litigation, while they have been injured by the same products, uh, no person really is injured the same way. In mass tort litigation, attorneys file each case individually with the intention to only have a few cases go to trial and with the goal of helping individuals receive fair settlements for their injuries. Many patients say no amount of money can bring back their life to what it was before surgery. It is why lawmakers from around the country are crossing the aisle and joining forces. It's not likely to happen immediately. It's going to have to be a sustained effort. Hi, Hi. I'm Francis. Francis uh, Still ahead, the change makers are listening. The medical device industry contributes generously to campaigns uh, and they lobby very effectively. So we have a big challenge here. I don't know how this will be received by some of the health care groups. I hope they'll be supportive. March was the first time lawmakers in D.C. met with patients who've experienced issues with medical devices. The goal? To spark change in the FDA's approval process and increase transparency, something the Institute of Medicine has been calling on for years. Traveling is not easy for Frances Scott. A metal-on-metal -metal hip implant that she says left her not only poisoned, but her muscles damaged. If our story can help and stop this from happening to others, maybe my family's suffering, like, won't be for nothing. Like she shared her story with us a few months ago, but is meeting Congressman Lloyd Doggett for the first time. I had the slightest idea that this device had never been tested on human beings. I would not have metal gotten it. Metal, you've never gone through this. Congressman Doggett wanted to meet Francis because he's pushing for two bills to increase transparency of medical device problems. It's not just hips, mesh, breast implants, and many other devices. Just seeing your stories and seeing how much misery was caused to some individuals and knowing from my own experience many years ago as a judge that I'd see some of these cases come up, uh, I thought it was important to make a difference. According to Device Events, a service set up by a former FDA worker to better track problems with medical devices, the FDA receives more than 80,000 reports of problems each month involving various devices, an antiquated system that makes it difficult for patients and doctors to understand the true scope of problems. My hope is that uh, we'll have enough citizen outrage over this, enough participation by the victims who've been directly affected along with their families that we can bring about some change. The FDA says only about 14% of medical device problems ever get reported. The New England Journal of Medicine estimates it is much less than that, less than 1%. Manufacturers, importers, and device user facilities like hospitals are required to report problems to the FDA. Right now, there are no requirements for doctors or patients, but as you've seen here, there really should be. You can submit a report to the FDA online or print it out and mail it or fax it. These stories, this information can be found on kvu.com slash medical device dangers. We also started a Facebook group that has resources, offers support or the ability for you to share information with others. I also share updates on the federal legislation and FDA hearings and recalls. Just search Medical Device Dangers on Facebook. Medical devices like stents, pacemakers, joint replacements can transform lives, but they can also cause irreversible, life-changing problems. Eight years ago, the Institute of Medicine called for the FDA to change the way it approves medical devices, not to stifle innovation, but to make it less likely that people get hurt. The system needs reform. What shape and when that will take place remains to be seen. Thank you for joining us and listening to these stories. Good night.